in London and we have uh, other fragments from the same piece, let's say the heads of the figures in Athens. Dimitrios Pandermalis heads the organization that's building Greece's new Acropolis Museum and he wants the marbles back permanently. They symbolize the highest uh, moment of uh, classical art in ancient Greece. They belong uh, to the Parthenon itself. But the British Museum is equally emphatic that this is not going to happen. You can't lend something to a, a, a sort of government or a country that doesn't recognize your, your ownership of them. As far as the British Museum is concerned, it has legal title to the marbles. Moreover, it has a mission as a museum of all world cultures. What the British Museum can almost uniquely provide is an opportunity to see the Parthenon sculptures in context, in context with civilizations that, that, uh, that flourished and, and uh, around the time of ancient Greece. You can also uh, uniquely see the, the huge inspiration that these objects have had on subsequent world cultures and how they have become now masterpieces of, of, of art and, and masterpieces of Greek civilization. But Professor Pandermalis isn't buying that argument. The story he wants to tell is depicted in the frieze itself, which shows an important Athenian religious procession. But only about 50% of the original frieze survives today. And of that 50%, about half are in London, and the other half are in Athens. He believes all the surviving pieces should be exhibited together, because seen together, they have a narrative. It's not correct for a piece uh, so important to have uh, fragments in different places and not all the originals to together next to the original building. And the British public seems to agree with him. Poll after poll shows that the people of Britain support the idea of returning the marbles to Greece. So would the British Museum then go against the voice of the British people? Well, I think we, you'd, you'd have, we'd have to look in a little bit more detail in terms of those polls, and I think it's worth saying that, that, that all of them are, are, are certainly now, you know, some years old. People think it's a simple decision, yes or no, they stay or they go, and that's it. And it isn't. It's a very, very, very complicated situation. For now, Professor Pandermalis intends to fill in the gaps of his freeze with copies of the British Museum's freeze, so that visitors can have a more complete vision of the procession that's depicted will paint uh, the copies with uh, special color to make a differentiation. Of course, uh, our target is that uh, we replace one day the copies uh, with the originals. And he's hopeful they can work something out. On the base of an exchange of uh, a friendly cooperation will be possible to get back uh, the maps of the pattern. The trustees, you know, we, we have a very generous loans policy. There isn't any, uh, uh, there would be no reason why that, that discussion couldn't take place. And perhaps this great symbol of civilization will ultimately inspire a solution that benefits everyone. Sure, a little video there, of course, about the Parthenon. Uh, which, by the way, uh, modern Greece, of course, trying to uh, rebuild it right now, at least sections of the outside of it. So, anyway, welcome you back, of course, Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Up here, having a great week uh, out there overall. Uh, of course, this week, kind of like cool here. It's like we got a little cool weather coming in, uh, of course, which feels great this morning uh, and all that. Um, so, everybody, everybody's having a you know great week out there uh, overall. Looks like. Um, one person right now watching live, uh, which is Critisha. So if you're having a great morning uh, you know, today, earlier. Uh, so anyway, um, of course, today, of course, part part uh, you know two lecture, of course, on ancient Greece. I'll be, of course, continuing uh, this lecture series on the Greeks, which I'll probably wrap up later in the week, uh, part three lecture on Friday. Uh, but um, anyway... A few announcements before I get started uh, overall. Uh, of course, we have a lot of assignments out, you know, right now uh, that are important, you know, because the seven weeks class, you know, it's kind of rolling along. You know, we don't have that long to go until uh, the end of the semester. I think the, the semester ends like early October. Uh, so it looks like y'all have got y'all's first exam, of course, to wrap up this week and uh, get out the way because hey, I'm going to be giving you the second exam, I think, on Friday uh, coming up, which will mostly be on the Greeks. 
uh, overall. Uh, and then, of course, the second vocab, that's something y'all need to also begin wrapping up on, too, because I think that's coming up as well due uh, at the end of the month. Uh, you do have the India quiz that I also gave you uh, as well. Uh, I'll send you reminders about that assignment as well. But that was that one I gave you that was kind of an extra uh, lectures I gave to you the other day. But um, if you didn't turn in the first vocab, you might want to get that to me. Uh, you know, if you're late on that, you want still credit for that because, uh, you, you know, you got the second one, of course, to wrap up on. So uh, anyway, um, like I said, today we're going to, of course, be moving on to talk more about the ancient Greeks. Uh, of course, as you see, I'm going to talk mostly about the Greek city-states. Uh, I'm going to, of course, have a focus on that today. Uh, I will be talking a little bit about the Greco-Persian Wars that do break out uh, close to 500 B.C. That's kind of a very famous period in ancient Greek history. Uh, so we'll talk about that. I don't know if I'll finish all that today, but I'll kind of wrap up on that today. And I think the next, la the third lecture I'll have later, which will kind of finish that. And later I will also talk about a little background into Greek culture, the classical Greek culture, of course, which the Parthenon, you know, is very famous for being, you know, part of that. Uh, you have any comments, questions about this lecture or, you know, previous lectures, you know, let me know. Of course, you can anytime leave me comments, questions, of course, uh, on my YouTube channel. Uh, and anybody, of course, can also leave me comments during the live stream uh, also as well. So it looks like Fernando's joining us uh, also uh, in the broadcast right now. So if you're having a great uh, afternoon uh, overall. Uh, here's the link to StreamYard.com uh, if you want to join me also as well. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, they had that little short video I showed you, of course, you know, about about the Parthenon, which is kind of controversial because of those Elgin marbles that are, you know, part of the artwork, of, you know, that was part of the actual Parthenon. Of course, half of them are in the British Museum, as you know. The other half is in the Acropolis Museum, which is in Athens. So that's the whole controversy over it. And of course, right now, the Republic of you know Greece is trying to reconstruct the Parthenon, at least the outside of the facade of it and all that. And so it was blown up in 1687, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So uh, anyway, um, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to, of course, talk about, of course, previously we had been discussing, you know, the Greek age, Hellenic age that kind of started around the 8th century when the Olympics, they think, started uh, in ancient Greece. A long time ago, if you remember correctly, the, the period of that era goes from like 776 to 323. It does go down, of course, to the death of Alexander the Great, who died in 323. Of course, he had that so-called Hellenistic age that came later. Uh, and um, as, you, as I talked about before, the Greeks founded city-states uh, throughout, you know, the Greek world. Uh, which there was a lot of, I think it was like over a thousand of them at one point that they founded throughout like the Aegean Basin or areas around that Greek part of the world uh, at the time. Uh, it's either called a polis or the plural I told you is poli, you know, which by the way, that word is kind of where we get a lot of words like police, policy, politics uh, today. Um, the word polis, I guess, was their word for civilization, of course, which word civilization comes more from the Latin word, I think, civitas, I think, is what the Romans say later. Uh, but I talked about how Greece was kind of divided into two main periods uh, during the main Greek age, which was archaic or old Greece, where Greece kind of started going back, you know, out of the dark age uh, from the Olympics up to maybe about 500. And then classical Greece is more like mostly just the fifth century down to about the time of Alexander the Great, uh, the primary periods of it. And um, like I said, there's hundreds and hundreds of these Greek city states. I forget. I see. I see all kinds of numbers and how many there were. You know, twelve hundred, fifteen hundred. Uh, I don't know exactly what the number was exactly, but there were hundreds and hundreds of them that were based all throughout. Uh, you know, the Aegean Basin uh, and all that. Now I'm kind of going to talk about a little today about you know kind of the parts of the you know the Greek city state that are kind of well known. Uh, most of these Greek city-states were built on a high point, uh, which they often call it a hilltop, or really the term is Acropolis, uh, is the term that they used the Greeks a long time ago. 
And um, the word Acropolis is different translations of it. It can mean like the upper part of the city or the top of the city is usually the translation of it. And uh, the one that's the most famous one, of course, that you may have heard about is, of course, the Acropolis, which I'll show you, of course, an image of that, uh, which is right here, which I told you that Greece right now is trying to rebuild a lot of these buildings uh, that were once on there. Most of these were built like around the 5th century B.C., basically about 2,500 years ago almost. But the Parthenon, of course, in the middle, you see that's the most dominant building uh, that's right there. Uh, the Acropolis was used for different things. Uh, it was used like as a fortification uh, in case of war. It was like a civic center as well. Uh, it was also where a lot of the uh, city-states like Athens uh, built a lot of their temples, you know, which honored various gods with the Acropolis, you know, honored uh, the one of the Parthenon honored basically Athena, you know, one of their patron goddesses. Uh, and um, so that's that's primarily what, what it was used for uh, with that. Uh, and here's another image showing the you know Acropolis uh, right here, like from an aerial view, uh, which the Parthenon you know, is over here, Athena Nike uh, is over here. Uh, also got the Erechtheon, which I think is, um, I want to say it's over that way, I guess. But uh, anyway, um, basically, um, you can see here, they also have the Agora uh, also as well, uh, which that's like the kind of a gathering area for all the citizens, like assembly area or gathering area uh, is what they usually refer to it as. It's like a public square. It's kind of very similar to, I guess, what the Romans had, which was like a, um, you know, the Roman Forum and all that. Oh, uh, that's well known. Uh, and um, the Roman, yeah, the Roman Forum uh, is kind of equivalent to the Agora uh, right there. And um, anyway, it looks like Aisha is also joining us uh, in StreamYard as well, uh, if you're wondering. But um there's other buildings that were built there too uh, on the site. So yeah, that's the, that's pretty much the main ones uh, I told you about. If you want to know all the ones, I kind of list them for you. But the Acropolis has got the Parthenon Temple, Athena Nike, that temple. John is Athena and Nike. Nike's the goddess of victory, also called Victoria by the Romans. The Erechtheion Temple, of course. I think I've got a picture of that one. I'll show you later. Uh, that's also another famous temple that's on the Acropolis as well below, which is above the agora. Now, um, also, um, if we go right here, the Athenians also had like all kinds of governments, like uh, like all these Greeks, Athenians, and other states kind of came up with different Greek governments that kind of ran uh, their states. Uh, and um, you can see there, there's kind of a list of all the different governments that were around at one point that they had. Originally, the monarchy was the traditional type of government, uh, which is the oldest, where they were ruled by kings. Uh, so you kind of go back to archaic or old Greece. You have that. And then they have the oligarchy uh, later that comes in that becomes popular. Oligarchy is a type of government where it's ruled by predominantly wealthy, wealthy like aristocrats, nobility, uh, in fact, the word oligarchy means uh, in Greek, uh, ruled by few, uh, ruled by a few, uh, basically. And um, that was popular for a while. Uh, Sparta, of course, we'll talk about later, was known for having an oligarchy, which they kind of spread that idea around. Uh, but over time, it was less popular uh, in Greece. Uh, they also had a tyranny or tyranny uh, as well. Uh, which is a type of government ruled by a tyrant who's like more like a dictator. That's like an aristocrat. aristocrat. In fact, it's where the Romans get the idea of the dictator later. Uh, they have in the Roman world. They experimented with those for a while, up to like, I think, the 6th century. But eventually they decided to get rid of those uh, as well. And then democracy uh, became the most famous type of government, which the Athenians were mostly behind in spreading it. Uh, throughout Greece. And the word democracy supposedly means ruled by the people, although I think the term dem or demo uh, is really dealing with the tribal groups uh, of the Greeks. 
because the Greeks used to break themselves down into tribes, which were kind of like tribal districts or whatever. Uh, but now it means people. So rule by the people. And that's where all the male citizens would participate directly in the government. Uh, and it, really, that one right there, democracy, was the most influential form of government that influenced other you know, cultures later up to modern times. Yeah, I think I had image showing like some of the images of like uh, the Parthenon, which Parthenon was not really built until the 5th century B.C., a little later, of course. Uh, but it was built like by the statesman Pericles, who I'll get to later, who was a famous politician in Athens, known for his reforms. And he rebuilt the actual Acropolis after the Greco-Persian Wars wrecked it. Um, of course, here's the Temple of Athena, Nike. Uh, they, they rebuilt that uh, as well. Yeah, right now they're trying to rebuild uh, the Parthenon, like reconstruct it uh, on, on mostly the outside. I don't know if they'll ever finish the inside of it, but I didn't know they're trying to work on the outside of it to restore it. Uh, the Rectathean, of course, another famous uh, temple which honored Athena and Poseidon is also, of course, well met uh, on the site of their Acropolis. So a lot of these buildings are trying to reconstruct uh, to, I guess, what they look like uh, in ancient times. Uh, but, um, yeah, it's kind of difficult. It's kind of controversial, too, trying to rebuild these buildings. Should they do it? You know, that kind of thing. I know it does, does come up uh, as well. All right, I'm also going to move on. I need to talk about also the fact that the Greeks were known for their military, uh, you know, forces that they had in the Greek world uh, throughout the Greek age uh, and all that. So all, all city-states relied a lot of what we call militias to, you know, defend their, their states uh, in general. Uh, and most forces um, that they had were basically militias. Militias were like these civilian manned armies uh, where they trained, you know, throughout the year. But they had like, you know, regular jobs that they had, occupations uh, overall. Uh, and most of them were composed of what they call hoplite. The, the so-called Greek hoplite was a type of heavily armed infantry soldier. You can see there, most of them were farmers, is what they were, like a kind of like a middle class. And uh, most of them um, fought with like a combination of shields, uh, hoplite spear, and of course, sh uh, Greek short swords uh, in close combat uh, type battle, uh, which, by the way, the kind of formation that they, of course, fought in uh, was what they call a phalanx. Phalanx, by the way, in Greek means supposedly battle line. Uh, so it's a type of rectangular battle formation. Depends on how many men, but it could be eight deep, 16 deep, I guess. Uh, but predominantly, they would fight in close formation uh, and using kind of overlapping shields with hoplite spears. Uh, they would try to push the opposing force off the battlefield. Uh, kind of like you actually have men in the back that would push the actual formation forward and try to drive the other force off. And then if they went to single combat, then they would pull out their swords and they would fight, you know, mano a mano, whatever, one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, using short swords. So so anyway, for a long time, the, the Greek phalanx was unbeatable. You know, down to about the time of Alexander the Great, uh, until, of course, the Roman legions came along and, of course, whipped it. Uh, let me show you some images, of course, of, um, of course, here's an image of showing a hoplite, I guess, reenactor, you know, wearing, um, I guess, some of the actual equipment that they wore. Uh, a lot of the uh, equipment that they wore uh, had to be purchased. Uh, so uh, the state usually didn't, you know, give you your military equipment or weapons uh, primarily. Uh, and so in many cases, you know, you know, if you that's why the middle class, I think, often was the ones or upper class that fought mostly in battles because um, they're the ones that could afford all the battle gear uh, in general. A lot of the upper class were usually like in the cavalry, things like that, or they were the generals that ran things in the middle class. Uh, was like uh, this is in Athens, of course, we're talking about, but and then the lower classes, like I know in Athens, were like the ones that rode the ships, <laughs> like in the navy, like the triremes, all that kind of thing, and you know, like battles. Now, they wore different kinds of armor. I'll kind of show you some kinds of armor that they wore. 
Uh, I could be like body armor, like que uh, like a cuirass, which is like a, a cuirass is like a type of torso armor uh, that was popular, uh, which was a uh, bronze cast. But uh, the only thing about the bronze armor was that it could weigh very heavy. I think get the weight on that, but I think it might have been like 30 pounds or more. Uh, so it's pretty heavy. Uh, they had other kinds of armor that were popular, like linothorax was a popular armor. Uh, probably cheaper, uh, which was made of linen, like from the flax plant, believe it or not. He also had lamellar, which I think that was the one that everybody wanted, lamellar, which was like a layered type armor. Uh, and so that was the typical kind of armor that most people uh, tended to use. Uh, I think I've got an image showing, I think, an example of some different types of armor, like a layered type armor right there you're looking at on the right. Um of course, they wore helmets, which most helmets, you know, and those, I don't think they had iron helmets. They had bronze helmets that they used in battle. That one right there you're looking at is a Corinthian-style helmet, uh, which was mostly famous for being used by the Spartans. Uh, and you can see it's got that plume that's on the top, that horsehair plume, uh, which was like kind of like an insignia, uh, by the way, uh, usually at the top. Uh, if it's kind of facing forward like it is. Uh, that was like a, I guess, a, like an infantry foot soldier. Uh, if, a, if a helmet was one where it was like facing you, the plume, that means that um, it's an officer, uh, basically. I think sometimes in battle, they would kind of wave their their plumes around too, like the, on the, with the helmet and kind of scare the enemy and things like that. And I think, I guess, they're, sometimes their helmets look scary looking, to kind of scare the enemy, uh, things like that well, as well. Uh, other things, too, um, like this is example. Of course, they have greaves, of course, which greaves is like, you know, like leg armor uh, to protect your, your mostly your um, shin or tibia, that bone down there on your leg. Uh, they call it shin armor. I think it's the common thing uh, for being attacked. So you're vulnerable there, you know, right there. They might even have them like on their arms. Uh, like, the, like they're on their forearms to block like sword blows or something like that uh, also as well. Uh, of course, the most famous thing they carried in battle was the uh, was the round wooden shield, uh, which was called a hoplon, you know, hoplon. And um, the word hoplon, by the way, is where the word hoplite comes from. So that's the origin of the word. And, uh, most hoplons, like you see here with this uh, round shield, which I guess got Pegasus on, I guess, right here, famous horse, uh, was usually a two-inch uh, thick wood made of usually oak. Uh, they maybe put a bronze skin on the outside of it, and, of course, they might put an image or insignia on it or something which represented their, their city-state uh, that they fought for. So, anyway, kind of showing you that uh, right there. But they had different... Um, formations like like i said they might have eight man deep 16 man deep uh they did have some like that became famous later like the macedonians later like under king philip ii and his son alexander the great of course used like they employed like uh these long spears which are you know we call pikes you know to basically defend against cavalry attacks that might attack like especially the center of their, center of their infantry some of those were double in size. I think the average hoplite spear was maybe like nine feet long. These were 18 feet long uh, in length that you're looking at. So anyway, um, so that's something that, that that's often very famous, you know, with, with the Greeks uh, in general uh, right there. Uh, let me go back up here and, of course, show you. But, yeah, most hoplite spears you see had two tips to them, by the way. Uh, which I think one was for a weight or extra tip in case one broke on it right there. But I guess he's kind of got it right the way it is. But basically, he, you know, use that left arm with the shield to block any kind of blows against you, uh, whatever sword or whatever it is. It's, I guess, really spears are trying to hit you. And you try to basically thrust it at the enemy. You'll try to kill him in front of you. Uh, basically, usually like up, up. Usually it's like above your head trying to stab the guy around your shield. But they would often overlap the shields and try to protect the guy that's next to them, uh, basically, uh, in battle. So, yeah, it was a clever formation. And uh, later, you know, when the um, 
Persians fought the Greeks. The Persians didn't really have an answer uh, for these phalanx formations. They got beat pretty bad, not just in Greece, but later in Persia when Alexander the Great invaded. All right, I'm going to move on next. I'm going to, of course, talk about uh, the next thing today. We're going to get into and discuss like the rise of some of the city-states, which the two most famous city-states that really came to power was, was Sparta and Athens. Those two uh, were like superpowers in the Greek world. It was almost like a comparison between like in the Cold War, when you have the United States uh, versus the Soviet Union. Not sure which one would be which uh, with this, but that's kind of like how it was, you know, in the Greek world. Uh, they didn't really like each other, uh, by the way, the two city-states. Even like they had like, you know, different forms of government, like the Athenians had democracy, you know, Spartans had an oligarchy. They even still had monarchs, which was different from you know, other states that didn't really have monarchs that much. Uh, so it kind of stood out as being kind of, you know, different, more or less. But um, Sparta started out as a Dorian state, uh, and uh, they were based in the southern part of Greece, an area called the Peloponnese, which is a peninsula that's on the bottom of, of Greece. I'll kind of show you a picture of, um, I guess, the where, where Sparta basically is. That That's actually a picture showing you, like, the entire area of, of the Peloponnese, or Pelopon, it's got different names, Peloponnese or Peloponnesian Peninsula, if you want to call it that uh, as well. Sparta's on the bottom, that little light blue area that says Laconia uh, right there. Uh, that's where Sparta basically is. The city of Sparta is kind of like the middle of it. They still call it that area, by the way, modern Greece today, Laconia. It is spelled the K or spelled the C. So it's spelled, spelled either way. Uh, they think the name of, of, of kind of was derived from, I think, the ancient Spartan homeland, which is Lacedaemon, so they say it. Uh, and Lacedaemon uh, is believed to be originally, um, it's named after an ancient king of Sparta, which may have been mythological. I'm not sure if he was real or not, uh, but that's where the name came from a long time ago. And supposedly you know, he had a wife, a king queen, who was named Sparta. And so hence the name Sparta, you know, being used uh, as the city uh, later. Uh, and so basically they believe this state kind of evolved sometime after the Greek Dark Ages uh, occurred. And like I said, they related back to the Dorian peoples that came in and settled a lot of the Peloponnese a long time ago. Now, uh, they always talk about this uh, man that kind of was famous with the Spartans named Lycurgus or King Lycurgus. Uh, who's well known. Uh, Lycurgus is seen as like the founding father of Sparta. He's like their great lawgiver, uh, basically. They're not sure when he lived or if he did live. Uh, they think he may have lived if he did in the ninth and eighth century. Of course, some people think he's just a legend. And he wasn't really a real person, uh, more or less. But some Greek writers like Plutarch you know, mention about Lycurgus. Like, in fact, Plutarch has got a really good book on you know, Sparta called On Sparta. You've heard about. And so he's kind of credited with supposedly, you know, creating a lot of, you know, Sparta's, you know, constitution, which would be like its court systems, its law codes. Some people call it the Code of Lycurgus or something like that. Um, he created a lot of their, you know, assemblies, uh, even created like their military school uh, to train, train their soldiers and things like that. Uh, and so he's considered very, very important figure. And I guess the first famous Spartan king, maybe of the Greek age, uh, and not including the Mycenaean period before that. They're not sure if the Mycenaean period was even real or not. It might be mythology, like Menelaus or whatever. He was real or not. They don't know. But um, Lycurgus is known for uh, founding the so-called military schools of the Spartans, which trained like a lot of the men uh, to become soldiers. And it was often called the agog, was the, was the common name uh, that they call it, which uh, means in Greek, supposedly, to rear or rearing uh, is what it meant. And so young boys from the age of seven would be taken from their parents, basically trained in these military, like this academy, uh, basically. I think the Greeks call it a gymnasium, what they called schools in those days. And they would train up to like the age of like around 20 basically when they would become like a Spartan soldier. And so these would later become the, the, the you know, Spartan ruling class, like the upper class 
uh, that would basically control the state. Because uh, Sparta really only has like really one class that's citizens. That's those that are Spartans, you know, that are basically in the military and in the women, of course, Spartan women uh, that they have as well. Uh, but anybody else is not really considered a citizen. Uh, yeah, you can see there what they call a peroico, yeah, peroico, uh, which is a um, like basically free citizen, free non-citizen. You could go to Sparta, like live there. Maybe you're a merchant or whatever you are uh, that, that goes to Sparta or whatever, but you don't really have any rights. So you got that, you know. Uh, and then you got the helots. The helots, that's another thing, too, uh, I want to mention, too, right now. Uh, the helots are these, they're either serfs or, of course, some claim they were slaves uh, that the Spartans basically um, forced into forced labor, like, like, slavery or like serfdom or whatever you want to call it, they don't really have any rights, even though they heavily outnumber the Spartans. Like I think Parada said seven to one or something like that, uh, the number. Uh, they basically do all the work, like farm work or whatever. Uh, and so Spartans really don't do anything except run the state and I guess fight wars, like military stuff, uh, pretty much. So they think they were, the, the, the Helots were basically these peoples that were I guess indigenous people that were already there uh, when the Spartans came in and took over and forced them to become like their, their slaves or serfs. But it's a debate about what it is. Is it they serfs or slaves? It's still controversial. They're still not sure which it is actually. But um, anyway, yeah, kind of talking about, you know, more, more about, about the Spartans. Uh, a little bit about their government, uh, which I kind of have talked about. Now, um, I'll get it. Let me first talk about the Spartans though, themselves. Uh, the Spartans, um, uh, overall, at the age of 30, like after they go through their military training, that's when they would become a full Spartan citizen. Uh, they sometimes call it a Spartiate, which might be a modern term that they later use, but that gave them the right to like hold office, to vote, and all those kind of things. And so they participate directly, you know, in the actual Spartan state. And most are in the military to like, I think close to 50 or something like that uh, for a long, long time. And there weren't that many Spartan soldiers. I think there may have been eight, 9,000 that might be in the Spartan military at one time or, or less. It's a very large city state, like the amount of land they controlled, but the actual people that ran it, the upper class and all that was not that many, actually. Um. Now, Spartan women, they women had rights, too. That's the interesting thing about the Spartans. It was kind of like this egalitarian society where everyone is kind of equal, unless you're not a Spartan, that kind of deal. But a lot of the women were educated, like the men were, although a lot of their education was more like prepping towards like marriage and rearing children on uh, things like that. Uh, but they had like a lot more freedom, you know, than most other women in other city states, you know, in the Greek world. And I, also there were more of them, which is true about uh, Sparta, because a lot of the men tend to get killed in battle and things like that. Uh, and so a lot of times I think the Spartan women were more, more promiscuous and things like that. Uh, maybe more than one husband over time and things like that as well. So now the Spartans... Um, Rely, like I said, on an oligarchy, which is true. They actually had monarchs. They had these two hereditary kings that would rule rule in power at the same time uh, in Sparta, which is kind of unique uh, about that. But they had also other people that would run the state uh, as well. Uh, they had this consul uh, that was called uh, the Garusia. Uh, that was called, which had I uh, forget how many it was on it, but I believe it was like around maybe thirty uh, that were on there. Uh, and included, I think, even the Spartan kings were involved in it uh, as well. So it, it was important in advising uh, the state. And I think it, it kind of maybe was used as like a court system as well. Uh, the appella was what they called the Spartan assembly uh, that they had, which only Spartans could you know, be involved in, like I said. And then they also had these magistrates that served one-year terms. They were called ethers, uh, and uh, they had five of them that helped ran the state. They advised the kings. Uh, they were also, they were pretty powerful, uh, the ephors that were uh, under the kings. But the kings had mostly military powers, I think mostly. It's predominantly what they did. 
by the most, et cetera. So that's that Sparta. So you know, Sparta is like you know this totally different state that's you know not known for too much except their military traditions. Uh, there's they're not known for you know too much culture uh, in general. Uh, I think they talk about the fact that Spartans really were a very serious people. Like if they make cracked a joke, it was like more like a serious joke, uh, that kind of thing. Supposedly, lack of diamond was also a term I think that meant. Uh, it's some kind of term that they describe their, their culture uh, as being like really serious uh, in general uh, and all that. So um, it was different compared to Athens. Athens was more of this open society, like a lot of culture and things like that. Sparta was more of a closed society, very militaristic, you know, and things like that. So big differences between those two cultures uh, in general, not just like government, et cetera. Right, I'm going to also move on. I'm going to talk about uh, as well uh, the other state that's kind of like a rival uh, to them, uh, which is you know Athens, uh, which is more located to the to the north or northeast uh, of the Spartan state uh, that you have. Athens was Ionian, so the Ionian type Greeks uh, that came into the Greek world and settled there. Uh, that's another big difference, too. They kind of spoke a different dialect, like the Spartans spoke Doric Greek, Athenians spoke Ionic Greek. Uh, and uh, they're located on the Attica Peninsula, which is a little bitty peninsula that's kind of to the northeast of Sparta. I think it's about 1,200 square miles in size, uh, roughly. But Athens, the Athenians, are more known for their culture, like I said, their cultural influences like democracy, history, philosophy, uh, etc. Uh, they're also known for their naval power. Um, so, you know, the Athenians had naval power. Spartans had their land land armies, as in comparison uh, between between the two. I'll show you kind of a, a area of, of where uh, Attica is, you know, compared to uh, the Peloponnese. But you can see here, Attica is kind of located uh, kind of northeast or east of of, of Basically, the Peloponnese. So Athens is right here. Sparta is like down here, uh, over here. So it's kind of a big difference. Not that far away, distance wise, you know, straight, but basically, they can see the differences between the two areas uh, that's there. Although, really, right here, they have the Isthmus of Corinth that kind of connects that peninsula with, of course, the Peloponnese over here. Be uh, they have the Boeotia over here. Eboa e is an island right here. Then Thessaly is up here. So it's kind of different areas that make up, you know, that area of the world. Um, you can see here uh, about Athens. And Athens was, of course, named for the Greek goddess Athena. Or they say Athenos, of course, the state. But, um, of course, famous daughter of Zeus. Uh, she's often associated with things like wisdom, like culture, you know, things like that, knowledge. Uh, she's also a war goddess uh, to the ancient Greeks. She also is the one that supposedly gave the Greeks, like Athenians, uh, the olive tree, uh, which first they say grew on the Acropolis uh, at Athens. The Romans later called her Minerva. Uh, is of course, her other name uh, that she's called. You can see her in this image on the right. I'll kind of show pictures of her later, Athena, but He's usually in the image of a hoplite soldier with a shield and spear right here, which they think that may have been the image of her, what she looked like uh, in the actual Parthenon temple a long time ago. So, so yeah, they're, they're known for their more like their naval power, but uh, they're very famous, you know, for, for democracy. That's the thing that I guess today uh, has influenced the world uh, more than anything. Uh, with the especially Western culture, I know a lot of Western you know states or whatever have been influenced by them, whether it be Roman, medieval, or whatever. Later, they influenced a lot of people, uh, the Greeks. Now, um, I'm going to talk a little about some of the early politicians that were kind of very famous uh, with uh, Athens. Uh, one of the first who's kind of important I'll get to today uh, is Solon. I'll talk about Solon a little bit. Uh, today. Uh, and uh, Solon, uh, often called Solon the Great, uh, some people call him Solon the Wise. Uh, he was a very famous Athenian politician that was known for making a lot of the first 
reforms to Athens that were kind of seen as being like democratic. I think he's kind of seen as an early um, reformer of democracy, father of father of democracy to Athens. Uh, and um, a lot of the early uh, magistrates that ran, like a lot of the city states like Athens, was called an archon. An archon was like a magistrate uh, in, they might run the government, they might be in the military or whatever, but uh, the word archon is where they get the word monarchy from, uh, or monarch, like the word where it comes from. In fact, archon means, uh, in Greek, it means leader, uh, basically. So the word, they think the word monarch kind of evolved from that word. Uh, and um, so he's famous for a lot of his reforms. Uh, one of the things that he did that's very famous He's the one that got the Athenians to begin to specialize in the development of, of olive oil production. Because uh, that's one thing that, you know, the Athenians are very famous for. Uh, like Greece today still produces a lot of olive oil, not the most, you know, anymore. Uh, I think Italy and Spain produce more olive oil uh, in the world. But I think they're third uh, behind those two countries uh, today. Yeah, it kind of later influenced them, you know, to create like an empire, so-called Athenian Empire uh, will, will merge with that. So they were known for exporting olive oil to people and uh, things like that. Also, he, he canceled all debts, which I think a long time ago, uh, before Solon came in, uh, if you were in debt, you could basically sell yourself into serfdom. Uh, it's become like a helot or whatever, uh, basically. Uh, and... Um, Oh, and child slavery. You could also sell your children into slavery was another thing that you could uh, also do uh, as well. Now, he reduced the death penalty uh, only to murder uh, was another thing that he did uh, as well. Uh, before that, they had these draconian laws where they could punish you for just about anything. Uh, Draco was a famous uh, Athenian tyrant, like aristocrat that was like a dictator who uh, ruled about about maybe mid seventh century, maybe close to about 650 BC. And draconian laws are kind of like harsh laws, basically, which you may, I think they still use that term today, draconian laws, when you think of laws that are kind of seem like they're harsh or whatever. Uh, but they eventually got rid of that. Uh, and so the only thing you could be put to death for uh, was supposedly murder, like mostly anyway. Um, oh, the other thing he did too uh, is he basically. Uh, established uh, a lot of the constitutions. That's the thing. He's, he's basically Athens' great lawgiver. So he's basically like the Spartan version of Lycurgus, uh, creating all their laws, create their court systems, their assemblies, uh, things like that. Uh, and um, he's known for creating at least two major assemblies they had that's well known. One that was called the Council of 400, or just what they call it, Bole, which a Bole was a type of Thenian assembly. Uh, which they called a consul, which the Romans called a consul too, uh, later as well. Uh, the consul 400 is one of the first. Uh, and then also the Ecclesia uh, was another assembly, uh, which was for most of the citizens of, of Athens, like the male citizens uh, participate with it. He also had this high court of appeal he created called the Areopagus. It's usually called, it's kind of equivalent to like, almost like our Supreme Court we have in the United States. Or other courts they have, uh, but it was a high court of appeal that dealt with like appeals cases and also capital punishment cases, and it was called Areopagus because it a lot of the judges would meet uh, on this place called the Rock of Ares uh, on the Acropolis or near the Acropolis, and so that's where it got the name from, well, basically. So he was instrumental in a lot of things. Uh, Solon. Oh, one more thing he did do I forgot that just kind of. In, Another thing that's famous uh, as well, he uh, divided up the social class system of, of Athens. So Athens had four classifications, uh, basically, um, depending on your standing in society, but um, you had two upper classes uh, that they had. Uh, they had aristocrats that were at the top, uh, and then the knights. Uh, aristocrats were usually the ones that were like the ones that ran the government and like the military uh, the knights were like in the cavalry. Uh, the middle class was mostly hoplites, which a lot of those I told you were farmers. Then your thets uh, was a nickname for these landless peasants. 
uh, that were mostly laborers, uh, and that's how they would break down uh, Athenian society. So that's up he did, uh, of course, when he was in power. Uh, however, though, Solon uh, did not stay in Athens. It's a theory that he left uh, and was replaced by uh, a few tyrants that took over. Like, in fact, Athens experimented with a few tyrants later, like Pisistratus that came in about 560 and reigned over 30 years uh, at one point. In fact, he had like two sons that reigned named Hipparchus and Hippias. Uh, most of these were basically aristocrat abilities that were interested in controlling the state, uh, similar to a dictatorship. And um, Greek tyrants, part of how they were able to maintain power uh, was through basically being a champion of the lower classes, the so-called thets I was telling you about. And they often would camp, confiscate land uh, from uh, the upper classes and give it to the poor people. Uh, and so that's why they were kind of seen as being popular, uh, even though they would often suspend sometimes certain constitutional laws and things like that. Uh, but it's also where the Romans got the idea, you know, for the their idea of a dictator uh, later. Uh, later, um, the um, what happened, like, they think close to about 510, uh, the, 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 the tyranny or tyranny of, of, of Athens was overthrown. Uh, I think one of the last ones, uh, I believe it was Hippias, uh, was overthrown through uh, Spartan aid. Spartan came to the aid of Athens and drove out. Uh, the, I guess the Spartans didn't like tyrants either. They drove them out. And then from there, what happened was they had a politician named Cleisthenes, who was an aristocrat. He formed basically democracy again. He restored it basically, they think, around 510 B.C., and Cleisthenes was kind of instrumental in kind of introducing uh, democracy uh, to the state. Uh, Cleisthenes was famous for like several things. Uh, one, he uh, established this new thing uh, called ostracism, where uh, if a certain citizen of a state was kind of an issue or problem, they could expel them, where all the citizens would vote uh, to remove somebody. And if there was a majority that voted to ostracize you, you couldn't come back until 10 years later. You could return, but it would be 10 years. You had to be you know, expelled, basically. You also create what they call the Council of 500, which replaced the Council of 400. Uh, they think that particular assembly uh, was considered one of the first real democratic assemblies uh, to be established because of the fact that the way they divided up Athens afterwards. And what happened was uh, Cleisthenes divided Athens into 10 tribes. Uh, which was like a district, basically. So 10 districts, which they call a deme, a deme, D-E-M-E, deme. Uh, and so each district uh, would be allowed to vote 50 representatives to that assembly, equal to 500. Uh, and so that's how, you know, early democracy kind of worked uh, in general. That's kind of how it does today. You know, the elections, how we have you know, voting districts or whatever, and they vote uh, people into office. That's something they did. But predominantly how they elected people in those days was by lot. You basically pick somebody out of a pot, whatever, and that person became uh, basically in power. So anyway, kind of, kind of talking about, you know, some of the different famous politicians that were in Athens. Now, I don't have, I'm not talking about today Pericles. We'll, we'll get to Pericles later. Uh, Pericles, of course, a later politician that rules in the 5th century, mid-5th mid century B.C., uh, he's, of course, well known for being one of their greatest statesmen. Uh, of course, he's very famous for reconstructing the Acropolis and the famous Parthenon that now sits there, of course, uh, at Athens. We'll, we'll come back later and talk about that you know, in, later in the week. Uh, I've got a few minutes left. Let me also move on uh, to get into and talk about the Greco-Persian Wars. That's, of course, a very famous event, uh, which, of course, happens uh, at the end of this period, we're talking about like, getting into the so-called um, classical age uh, of Greece. And um, Persian Empire was an Iranian state uh, that developed uh, in Iran, like Persia, they call it today, uh, and emerged like sometime in the mid-6th century B.C. 
Uh, they believe the Iranian peoples were related back to Aryan peoples or Indo-Aryan peoples uh, that came out of like Eurasia, like north of that area and settled there thousands of years ago. Uh, and um, kind of kind of talk about about this particular empire. The Persian Empire uh, was a massive empire. You can see the size of it right here uh, in this map. Uh, it was founded, they believe, by the King Cyrus the Great. Uh, sometime in the about uh, close about maybe 558 BC, about uh, and of course later on it was called the Achaemenid Empire or Achaemenid Dynasty. Of course, the dynasty of great kings that would of course rule over it uh, down to about the time of Alexander the Great. Uh, and uh, the Persian Empire was a multi-ethnic state. Uh, it originally started around 558. Uh, with the merging of several states, like most of the kingdoms of Persia and Media uh, were merged first. Uh, the Medes, which were more to the north, close to the Caspian Sea, and then Persian state, which was more towards where the Persian Gulf is, southern Iran. Uh, Scythia, Bactria, uh, those were other states uh, that also uh, were later added to the empire uh, in Iran. And then from there, uh, starting in the 6th century, it then spread. It spread throughout the Near East. Uh, they took control of Turkey. Uh, they took control of Iraq, Mesopotamia, you know, uh, Israel, Syria, Egypt. Uh, they even pushed at one point all the way to Afghanistan and into Pakistan, uh, where the Indus River is in northern India, close to 2 million square miles. I mean, it was eventually the size of, of this empire. It even stretched into part of Europe, trying to take over like where Greece is today as a whole. So basically the Persian Empire uh, at that time was the largest empire in the world. It was in the 5th century when they started battling between the Greeks and them. And their population was huge. They think at one point the population may have exceeded 50 million possibly that they ruled over. You can see they actually ruled over three continents at one point, part of North Africa, uh, part of you know Europe, like southeast of Europe anyway, and then part of basically the western part of Asia uh, as well. All right, you can see that map. They had a famous road that connected their empire. Uh, it was known as the Royal Road. Uh, it was a type of Persian highway system that, they, that was built in the early 5th century by the king uh, Darius the Great, uh, one of their great kings. Uh, and it connected mostly Iran with Iraq and Turkey. Uh, and it stretched close to 1,700 miles in length. In length. Uh, and it was really important in kind of linking up their empire, not just, you know, for their militaries to move around or whatever, but obviously to expand trade uh, with their economy uh, in general. I think Herodotus even talks about how, I think, actual messengers that went from like Susa, where it started in southern Iran, to Sardis in Turkey, it took them seven days by horseback, uh, basically to do that. Uh, I think two months if you walked it or something like that from east to west. Uh, across it. Uh, Darius even divided the whole empire uh, into local uh, governments like type states, uh, which they called a satrapy, I think was the term they used for it, and had local governors that uh, were called a satrap, which the word satrap, I think meant Persian, meant protector, uh, basically. And there were 20 of these all throughout uh, the Persian empire. They're kind of like the eyes and ears of the Persian kings. But a lot of times, I think some of the local governors were even local people that lived there uh, in those various provinces. Uh, you can see on the bottom of that map, uh, they had different capitals, but the one that's the most famous is later Persepolis. That's later capital. They think Darius built it. Uh, Darius the Great. Uh, and it became the capital of the Persian Empire between the 5th and 4th centuries until it was destroyed by Alexander the Great, who burned it down. Uh, by the way, I think in the year 330, I think he burned it, uh, basically. Uh, one more thing about them that's very famous. Uh, the Persians had a different religion. Uh, they had what they call Zoroastrianism. That was their main religion, believe it or not, which it was for a long time in Persia until Islam came in. Uh, and, um, you know, compared to the Greeks who have Zeus and all that. And uh, Zoroastrianism was a type of Persian religion, which was based on a Persian god named uh, Hura Mazda, which supposedly meant Lord, wise Lord, I think is what the translation of what it meant. 
god of wisdom, and uh, supposedly it was a type of religion that was based on the teachings of an Iranian prophet uh, that was named uh, Zoroaster or Zarathustra is the other name uh, it's often called. And uh, over time, it spread throughout the empire. And so it was actually a monotheistic religion that was actually pretty popular uh, for a long time. But over time, it later was stamped out by Islam, which, which came in um, kind of spread in that area. But they did think that Zoroastrianism had an influence on a lot of the other religions later, like Judaism, Christianity, Islam, uh, they think. Now, um, I'm going to get into and talk about, you know, what sparked the war. Uh, of course, the so-called Persian Wars between ancient Greek city-states and, of course, the Achaemenid Empire, of course, that was in the east. Uh, they think it happened mostly under King Darius the Great. Uh, of course, one of their great kings they had uh, who ruled like mostly in the early, early 5th century. Uh, and uh, you see in that map how, you know, the Persian Empire is, you know, moving east to west. Well, as they do that, they push into the Greek world, especially in Western Turkey. Western Turkey was really the, well, the hot point where, where the wars really broke out. A place called Ionia, uh, which is kind of like Western Greece, excuse me, Western Turkey, uh, where Ionian Greeks had settled a long time ago. And that's, that's when the thing really broke out. They had this revolt break out in 499 BC, where Ionians that are there don't want to be under Persian rule. And so there was a city state called Miletus that revolted. And so Darius came in with Persian forces, sacked the city. Uh, this upset a lot of Greeks uh, in the Greek mainland. And so the a Athenians sent a fleet, you know, and also a hoplite force to basically attack them. And the next thing you know, you know, the Greeks go actually cross land. They attack Sardis, which is a Persian city there on Western Turkey, that blows up the whole war uh, at that point. I think the Ionian revolt lasts a few years, but Darius puts it down. Uh, but they think in the end, uh, what, what ends up happening is Darius decides that he's going to invade, uh, of course, uh, Greece, uh, of course, which will have like two invasions, of course, which will be later. Uh, before I talk about the, you know, the Greek-Persian wars, I did, did want to mention, of course, about, you know, the famous, you know, historian that, you know, writes about, of course, you know, the Persian Wars uh, that were going on when Darius invades, you know, and all that. But, uh, yeah, Herodotus, you know, uh, who we've talked about before, uh, the father of history, he's our main historian, of course, that writes about the uh, Persian Wars. Uh, he gives us a lot of information about the Achaemenid Empire. Uh, he even includes in book two, uh, History of Egypt, because the fact that uh, the Persians have come in and taken over, you know, Egypt's territories uh, and all that. And so his books are kind of instrumental in describing a lot of the battles, like Battle of Thermopylae, et cetera. That's why we know a lot of information about these wars. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of criticism towards uh, Herodotus. Uh, some claim he kind of exaggerates. Uh, there's kind of speculation about whether his information is really accurate or not. Uh, but he's really the oldest source that we have, of course, uh, on these wars. There's other writers that wrote about, you know, those wars, but his, of course, is the oldest and most important that we have. So um, I'm going to talk about, of course, uh, King Darius the Great. Uh, 490 BC, he sends an invasion force uh, to attack Athens. Uh, he's kind of mad about the fact that one of his Persian cities, Sardis, has been attacked. Uh, and so he sends a naval force uh, with a small army, I think 30, 40,000 troops, uh, to try and attack Athens. His plan, of course, is to sack Athens in return, maybe even conquer Greece. I think he's thinking uh, might add that to the Persian Empire. And so he's going to land forces in Attica, uh, which is the peninsula I told you about where, where Athens is today, so-called Bay of Marathon, of course. And I uh, kind of got a map showing you the area of where his forces would come ashore, uh, which is right. You can see the Bay of Marathon uh, in this image right here. Uh, as you know, um, this leads to one of the first famous battles of the Greco-Persian War. So you have the so-called Battle of Marathon, which happened this month, by the way, uh, a long time ago, 490 BC. Uh, you can see 
yeah, almost 2,500, 2,500 years ago, just about. Uh, you had this battle uh, that broke out. Uh, not just the first major battle of the Greco-Persian War. It's also seen as the first, you know, European battle you know, in, in European history uh, that you that you really have. Uh, and um, you know about the Battle of Marathon. Marathon, um, this particular battle, um, the Greeks were heavily outnumbered. Uh, if you study about it, the, the Persians were led by this general named Datis, uh, who had about maybe 30,000 troops. And then the Greeks had about 10,000 uh, forces uh, that were involved. Most of them were predominantly Athenian. Uh, they were sent there uh, as well. And uh, I think there was another state called, I want to say Plataea, I believe was the other one, I believe that sent forces as well. And um, at the battle, there was kind of confusion about what to do uh, exactly. If you go to this uh, picture here, uh, they had like this one general they had uh, named Miltiades. Actually, back the, I think they call it Stratagos, I think is what they called like a, 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 Greek, a Greek general. Uh, they had 10 of them uh, who were there. Uh, they didn't know what to do well, exactly. And Miltiades uh, had been actually, had fought with the Persians before. He had been like a mercenary. Uh, and so he kind of knew their tactics a little bit. And so he came up with this flanking maneuver to try and attack, of course, uh, Darius's forces that had been sent there. And so he outflanked them. Uh, was what basically the Greeks did. And they, and they actually routed them. Uh, with with heavy casualties to the to the Persians. I think I have an image showing you the actual uh, battle, uh, which uh, is right here. Um, I think it's right here, showing it here. And um, you can see how that the Greeks brought up a force uh, which uh, eventually outflanked them on their left and right flanks, uh, and eventually destroyed them. So. Um, now, of course, the, the Persians tried to get back on their on their ships uh, at that point. Uh, and so literally some of them were actually killed as they got back on their on their ships and fled at that point. And uh, the, the Persians were going to, I think they thought at that point what they could do is then get in their ships at that point, sail around the peninsula and maybe reach Athens. But uh, what the Greek forces did at that point was they basically ran back to Athens and got there before the Persian forces got there. And so the Persians realized that they weren't going to be able to attack Athens, and so they went home. Uh, it was pretty much uh, the end of the battle. Uh, now, there is this side story uh, that they always talk about, uh, the Battle of Marathon. And, of course, you may have heard about, you know, where Marathon uh, gets its name uh, in all that, which I'll kind of uh, talk about today. There's a man named uh, Pheidippides. Uh, he was, you know, real, real famous with this particular battle. Uh, of course, it's where the word marathon uh, came from uh, in ancient times. But supposedly before the battle, uh, the Greeks sent a messenger uh, to try to get aid uh, from Sparta. Um, I think he went, ran there, and the Spartans were like, well, we're in the middle of a religious festival. We'll send troops when it's over. And by the time the Spartans got there, the battle's over. Uh, so the Greeks had won, uh, luckily. Uh, and then Pheidippides, uh, after the battle, after they had won, uh, then ran supposedly to uh, what is Athens to basically tell the people uh, that they that they won. And of course, he ran supposedly around 26 miles, 26.2 miles, which is now you know the so-called marathon run uh, that you have today. And when he got there, he said something like Nike, or I think actually Nikemen. Is what they said, which means to conquer a victory, uh, basically. And he dropped dead, uh, was, of course, the legend. Uh, they think that they're not sure this is really true or not uh, about, about the Dipodes. Uh, there's different sources on it. I know Herodotus mentions him. Uh, also, the Roman writer Lucian uh, mentions him. But Herodotus does not mention about there being some kind of marathon run. Lucian does. So there's kind of a debate about whether it really happened or not. Uh, the actual run, but they do know that uh, Pheidippides later popularized this idea of the marathon run, uh, which became something that was done at the Olympics uh, in 1896. So it's more of a modern game, you know, like sport uh, that was invented later 
where you run 26 miles and there's all kinds of shorter versions, you know, the marathon, half a marathon and whatever, 4K or whatever they got now uh, that are kind of similar to that, uh, you know, in modern times. Now I'm going to get to it later, but after um, Darius, Darius later assassinated, he's not able to really uh, conquer, you know, um, Greece at that point. And so what's, I'm going to get to it later. We're going to talk about a second invasion that's going to come later where uh, Xerxes, his son, comes back and attacks uh, Greece. A massive, massive invasion, of course, that'll take place. Uh, and that's really the one that you may have heard of that's real famous, uh, probably the most famous aspect of the Greco-Persian Wars. Uh, and he actually almost does. He comes very close to conquering it, but uh, the Greeks eventually prevail, you know, uh, in the end. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk about that more later uh, in the week. Uh, of course, on Friday, Friday I'll be kind of wrapping up uh, talking about the Greek city-states, uh, the Persian Wars. I'll kind of talk a little bit about the Peloponnesian War that they think kind of helps to cause the decline of the Greek city-states uh, afterwards. And I'll also talk about uh, examples of classical Greek culture uh, as well that were in the Greek world. I'll talk about the Olympics. I'll talk about some of the famous drama plays that the Greeks were kind of known for, famous philosophers like Socrates. We'll talk about him uh, as well. And I'll also talk about some Greek mythologies, like the different kinds of gods uh, that the Greeks believed in, uh, et cetera. Uh, and that'll wrap up that later, of course, uh, in the week. So um, that's it for today. Uh, of course, if you have any comments, questions, you know, uh, about this lecture, you know, please let me know, of course, uh, through my YouTube channel. Uh, as well. Uh, and um, like I said, don't forget about those assignments that y'all have got coming up. Of course, uh, I told you, I think I had a bunch, I think I, I mentioned before. I know the main one is the first exam. You need to wrap that up by Friday, you know, get that out the way. Uh, second vocab, of course, coming up later. If you haven't given the first one, better send it to me. Uh, then don't forget, of course, about the India quiz uh, that I've got uh, out there. Uh, as well. So that's it for today. I'll see you later Friday, of course, for that part three lecture, of course, on ancient Greece. Remember, Greece is going to be our major topic, which, of course, will be on our second exam. So y'all take care. I'll see you later, pretty much.